Did COVID escape from a lab? It's a controversial theory that early in the pandemic, scientists were quick, perhaps too quick, to dismiss. But it's a question that seems to be coming up more and more often. And it's not just conspiracy theorists. Politicians are demanding answers. And a group of eminent researchers has written an open letter asking that the origin of the coronavirus be more thoroughly investigated, including the possibility that it could have escaped from a lab. So how can we find out where COVID came from? And how likely is it that it came from a lab? Or even worse, was made in one? There's lots to unpack here and some fascinating journalism, uncovering possible cover-ups, questionable lab practices and deleted data. But I want to concentrate on the genetic evidence, what we know so far based on COVID's genetic code, and how we'll hopefully work out where it actually did come from. And that means we're going to have to start by looking at some coronavirus genetics. Though we call the current pandemic the coronavirus, coronaviruses are actually a family of different kinds of virus. The one that causes COVID-19 is known as SARS-CoV-2, and they have a genetic code made up of RNA, which is written in four chemical letters, A, C, G and U. The RNA code of SARS-CoV-2 is just under 30,000 RNA letters. And here it is, printed out on a sheet of A4 paper. That's it. I think it's worth taking a moment to marvel that the world has been changed forever by a code just 30,000 letters long. This is the biological recipe for something that can break into cells, make people very sick, and even kill them, and spread worldwide at a speed sufficient to overwhelm whole countries and healthcare systems. And yet, it can fit on a single side of a single sheet of paper. Admittedly in quite a small font, but still, that's incredible, isn't it? Now, of course, not all coronaviruses share the same genetic code. The process of reading all of these letters is called sequencing, and this particular sample was sequenced in Wuhan in China in December 2019. It's the reference sequence that scientists use to compare all other SARS-CoV-2 coronaviruses to, and I like to call it SARS-CoV-2.0, which isn't, I think probably should be, the official nomenclature. Different parts of the genetic code are recipes for different parts of the virus. For example, on this version, I've highlighted the 3,822 letters responsible for making the spike protein, the famous protein by which coronaviruses gain access to our cells. Of course, SARS-CoV-2.0 is now old hat, and we live in the world of coronavirus variants. So let's take a look at how classic COVID compares to some of the newer models. This is the Alpha variant, which was a huge driving force behind the very grim winter of 2020 to 2021 here in the UK, and which has now spread across the world, ousting SARS-CoV-2.0 wherever it found it. And as you can see, I've printed it out on transparency, so we can overlay it with classic COVID and play a game of genetic spot the difference. Let's just get these lined up. I've highlighted the defining mutations in yellow. If a coronavirus has changes in these specific spots, it's defined as an alpha variant. Let's take a look at a few so we can get an idea of what's going on. Here are two deletions in the spike protein, a six letter deletion here and three missing letters here. And there's also this one, known as N501Y, one of the first spike protein mutations that started causing real concern in the scientific community. Just by turning a letter A into a U, and thus changing a single building block on the protein, which seems to make the spike better at sticking to the receptor it uses to get into our cells. There are obviously quite a few other changes, and I won't go through them all, but there's a total of 46 letters changed or deleted between SARS-CoV-2.0 and SARS-CoV-2 alpha. Amazingly, this tiny number of changes is enough to make it around 50% more transmissible and maybe a bit more deadly too. As another example, this is the Delta variant, and it actually has even fewer defining mutations than alpha, just 27. And yet the Delta variant seems to be even more transmissible than alpha and more resistant to vaccines too, especially if you've only had one dose. Again, I just find it mind blowing that you can alter just a few letters of this 30,000 letter genetic sequence and substantially change the behavior of the virus. These changes happen at random. So the more people COVID infects, the more chances it gets to roll the dice. And potentially get lucky, from the virus's perspective at least. So that's a bit of introductory coronavirus genetics to provide a bit of context. And now we've got the tools to consider the evidence so far that COVID could have leaked from a lab. <laughs> 
And there is one particular lab at the centre of this controversy, the Wuhan Institute of Virology, or WIV, which is based, unsurprisingly, in Wuhan, which is where the first enormous coronavirus outbreak took place. Could this possibly be coincidence? WIV does find itself in a rather unfortunate spot. It's a lab specialising in research into coronaviruses, and it also contains China's first Biosafety Level 4, or BSL-4 lab, the highest level of lab safety, a type of lab which takes very careful precautions, or hopefully does anyway, so they can work with the most dangerous infectious diseases. You can see why people might be getting a bit suspicious. However, as good scientists, we should note that correlation is not the same as causation. And in fact, the causality could well run the other way here. Thinking of setting up a world-class, super-safe coronavirus research lab? Maybe you'd pick a location near to lots of natural sources of coronaviruses. If so, bullseye WIV. And we should probably find out whether people in charge of commissioning the institute want to build their next laboratory. It might also be that the coronavirus outbreak started elsewhere, but was just picked up in Wuhan, because that's where the coronavirus experts were. In much the same way as Alpha, formerly known as the UK variant, might not actually have emerged in the UK, but just been detected here, because the UK was sequencing so, so many more coronavirus cases than other countries were at the time. These ideas aren't enough to entirely exonerate the lab, but it's obviously not an open and shut case. So, assuming the causality does go from lab to global pandemic, how could a virus get out? Firstly, SARS-CoV-2.0 could have been a natural virus, collected on one of the Wuhan lab's many excursions to collect samples from wild animal species. Accidental release of deadly viruses from secure labs is sadly not without precedent. In fact, the last known death from smallpox resulted from a lab leak. In 1978, a medical photographer in the UK caught the disease, probably by airborne transmission from the lab downstairs from where she worked. In more recent times, and in spite of more stringent safety standards, there have even been releases from BSL-4 facilities. A scientist got infected with the original SARS while studying it in 2003, and, even more seriously, an epidemiologist caught Ebola in a lab in Sierra Leone in 2014. So clearly it's possible that mistakes could have been made. And to back up this theory, some people are pointing to the fact that we already know there's a virus which looks very similar to SARS-CoV-2, which was collected by researchers working at the Wuhan Institute of Virology. A bat virus called RATG13. What's raised even more eyebrows about this particular virus is that it was collected from a mine in southwest China, where, in 2012, six workers fell ill with an unexplained pneumonia. And its genetic code is 96.2% similar to that of SARS-CoV-2. Could this be SARS-CoV-1.9 beta, the development version of classic COVID? Let's take a look at the comparison between RATG13 and SARS-CoV-2.0. The first thing that's really striking after looking at Alpha and Delta is <laughs> that is a lot of yellow. In fact, let's bring back Alpha for comparison. RATG13's 96.2% does sound pretty similar, but actually it's quite different in coronavirus terms. Alpha is 99.8% identical to classic COVID, and Delta is 99.9% identical. So, if the theory is that it was an accidental release of RATG13 that caused the pandemic, you can see from these comparisons that that's actually pretty unlikely. Alpha and Delta had months to work their way through tens of millions of human hosts, before happening on a cocktail of mutations that made them more transmissible. It seems highly unlikely that RATG13 could have been released from the lab, and then made all of these hundreds of changes necessary to become SARS-CoV-2 in a short enough period of time, circulating in a small enough human population that it would just go entirely unnoticed. It could, of course, be that there's another coronavirus in another freezer somewhere else in the Wuhan lab, which is a stronger contender. But RATG13 doesn't look like it's the one. The next theory is that the virus could have been generated by what's called gain-of-function research. This is where scientists purposely try to make a virus more contagious or more deadly, in an attempt to understand what kinds of genetic changes are responsible for changes in the virus's behaviour when it infects humans. In one controversial example, in 2011, 
Two groups of researchers infected ferrets with a flu virus that normally only infects birds, giving it the chance to mutate so it could be transmitted from ferret to ferret. This research is controversial because it's very dangerous. It's basically accelerating the natural process by which a new pandemic-capable strain of flu might emerge. The argument in favour is that if we can do these experiments in controlled conditions, we can begin to understand what kinds of changes make a virus more likely to transmit between people. And that would mean that we could get ahead of the next pandemic. We might be able to design drugs or vaccines before the pandemic actually happens. The strongest argument against is that, as well as the risk of these viruses just escaping the lab by accident, publishing the experimental protocol in any level of detail could allow a terrorist group or a rogue nation to use the same techniques to make their own weaponized superbug. So, could COVID have come from gain-of-function research at the Wuhan Institute? If the starting point for SARS-CoV-2 was RATG13, it would have required a ridiculous number of infected ferrets in order to generate this many mutations. Remember, Alpha and Delta differ in only a handful of places after months and months of circulating in millions and millions of people. So turning RATG13 into COVID would be a seriously long-term project. The only reason this is possible in the lab with flu viruses is that they mutate a lot faster than coronaviruses do. A related idea is that COVID could be an engineered virus, created by purposely altering its genetic code. In this case, you might expect its RNA to look very similar to another virus's, except for a few large sections which might have been deleted or altered. Perhaps the nefarious scientists would take the original virus and swap in a more infectious spike protein, for example. The first reason why this is unlikely is because, currently, we simply don't have the knowledge to engineer a virus as purposefully as this idea implies. Scientists are still debating which exact genetic changes make alpha more infectious, and whether it's the changes to the spike protein we talked about earlier, or other alterations which might help the virus evade our immune systems. Given that we're not in a position to explain how alpha became more contagious, we're certainly not in a position to purposely design a virus to be better at infecting people. A more visual way to explain this is when you look at both genomes, comparing RATG13 to SARS-CoV-2.0. And what you can see is that there's a pretty random pattern of changes scattered throughout the whole genome, rather than a big section like the spike protein just swapped out. This further strengthens the argument that bat COVID and human COVID diverged by natural evolution, rather than by genetic tampering. Nonetheless, the case for the prosecution is that WIV has conducted some virus engineering gain-of-function research of its own in the past. A 2015 paper caused some controversy when Wuhan researchers spliced two viruses together. They took the original SARS-CoV-1 virus, responsible for the SARS outbreak in 2003, and spliced it with the spike protein of a different coronavirus found in bats. The new chimeric virus successfully infected human cells in a dish, and showed that the bat coronavirus's spike protein was capable of gaining entry to human cells, a warning that a bat virus could potentially jump directly from bats to humans. So, could SARS-CoV-2 have been generated by an experiment with SARS-1 gone wrong? Again, we can return to the genetic sequences to see if that makes sense. And comparing SARS-CoV-1.0 from 2003 to 2020 newcomer SARS-CoV-2, well, there are differences everywhere. Insertions, deletions, letters changed all over the place. While these are both coronaviruses, so they share many common genetic features, they're clearly not that closely related. This 2015 paper may have been a dangerous experiment whose risks outweighed its benefits, and that debate is very much worth having. But this particular research clearly wasn't the source of the current coronavirus pandemic. And this brings us to how we will eventually work out where SARS-CoV-2 really came from. Years of detective work after the original SARS outbreak isolated more and more closely related viruses. And by looking at how similar they are and which mutations they share, you can draw a kind of family tree showing how these various different viruses are related to each other. The clincher for SARS-1 was finding some closely related viruses in bats, followed by identifying a 99.8% similar virus in an animal called a civet cat. And what this suggests is that SARS-1 probably started out as a bat virus that was then passed to civet cats and then to humans. What we're waiting for is a similarly convincing genetic family tree for SARS-CoV-2, 
And it's vitally important that we investigate this thoroughly, because understanding how this pandemic began could help us prevent a similar coronavirus pandemic in future. The reason it's important that we don't rule anything out is that how we might prevent that hypothetical future pandemic depends a lot on where this one came from. If COVID really did come from a lab, our response might be to improve lab biosecurity or clamp down on gain-of-function research. If it emerged from a market or a cave full of bats, the changes required would obviously look very different. So, until we find COVID's closest cousins, we can't rule anything out, including a lab leak. There should be a full investigation that takes all possibilities seriously, and we should demand full transparency from the Wuhan Institute of Virology, the Chinese authorities, and everyone else involved. It's also important that, regardless of the origin of SARS-CoV-2, this isn't an exercise in assigning blame. Pandemics are a global problem, and preventing them requires global cooperation, not nationalistic finger-pointing. But, based on the evidence so far at least, it doesn't look like we've got a solid case for a coronavirus conspiracy. However, nor have we got convincing evidence of a natural source for the virus. The only option is to keep looking for SARS-CoV-1.9, and hope that its lessons can help us avoid SARS-CoV-3.